Welcome to the root of all success with the real Jason Duncan, a podcast that explores how the world's most powerful entrepreneurs unlocked success and how their stories can help you do the same. A successful educator turned entrepreneur, Jason has built multi-million dollar businesses that have been featured in Inc. Magazine and Entrepreneur Magazine. His life's mission now is helping entrepreneurs live what he calls hashtag the exit lifestyle. Introducing TEDx speaker, mastermind leader, author, entrepreneur, cigar aficionado, motorcycle enthusiast, and host of the root of all success, the real Jason Duncan. The The real real Jason Jason Duncan. Duncan. Welcome to another show, another episode of The Root of All Success. I am the real Jason Duncan. So glad that you decided to tune in today and listen. I've got a fantastic guest today, and I'm going to introduce him in just a second, but we're going to talk about how we got connected. And uh, I'm going to I'm going to wait until he gets on gets on camera and we turn it on for him uh, to talk about how we got connected, because I, I love the power of social media. I love the power of how we can connect with people that we probably wouldn't ever in any other lifetime get connected with. And yet those connections can be so valuable. So so today I'm interviewing a guy by the name of Rene Rodriguez, and he is considered by many uh, as the leading author on leadership and influence. He's a best-selling author. He's a keynote speaker. He's a leadership advisor. He's a transformational speaker coach. And for the last 27 years, Rene has been researching and applying behavioral neuroscience to solve some of the world's toughest challenges around leadership, sales, and change. And I, as someone who used to teach school, um, I love the idea of neuroscience and neuroplasticity and, and how, how our brains work. And this guy has done some deep study in that and how that affects us as entrepreneurs and leaders. He's an entrepreneur. He's a CEO of multiple companies, and he integrates a, integrates a practical business approach that takes his audiences to a place where they can actually do it. Because there is no <laughs> there is no change by talking about it. There's only action in doing it. And through his keynotes, his boot camps, his workshops, his proprietary Amplify system and his course, which we'll talk about a little bit, he helps you build your own backstory. Like, how does that really work to frame up not only your unique value propositions, but also a, a beautiful picture of your life and how you can live your life better? His audience is described as, as powerful, um, thought-provoking, authentic. And they say things like you could have heard a pin drop. And I can, I can attest to that because I heard him speak live at an event in Vegas just a couple of months ago. And that in fact was the experience as an audience member listening to him speak. The result that he gets his people are greater influence, personal transfer, transformation, and an immediate results in business and, and in your life by engaging with courage and with grace and a uh, great guy. And I'm proud to welcome to the root of all success, Renee Rodriguez. Thanks for having me here, man. It's so good to, uh, to connect with you here on the show. And I alluded to this in the intro, <laughs> how, how we, how we connected. And of course I told you that a brief little piece of that story when I first said hello to you at the, at the conference, but I'd seen your, a, a, a video on TikTok. Uh, of you talking and you do lots of videos and you're always well-dressed three-piece suit, you know, or at least a two-piece, you know, you're always dressed really nice in your TikTok videos. And, and I saw that and I didn't know you from Adam, never heard of you before, didn't know anything about you. And I saw that video. And then, then I go to that conference like two days later and here you come walking across, you know, the room. And I'm like, that's a guy just saw on TikTok, isn't it? (laughs) Isn't it? I don't know how they knew. (laughs) That's why was TikTok listening. So, um, well, welcome to the show, man. I'm glad you're here. So where are you today? Where, where is home for you? Uh, well, one, thank you for having me on here. I'm a, a big fan of what you've been doing. I've been, I took a view of some of your, your podcasts and I just love what you're doing. There's, there's a lot of podcasts out there, but very few are done well. And yours is definitely a really, really well done one. I'm actually at home right now, which is wild. I'm never, I, I think I'm home next month, one day of the month and then four days this month. And so you caught me at home in the studio. And so it's a, it's a good day to be home. So where's home for you? I live in Minnesota. 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 Is that where you're from? Is that is that home home? No, I'm originally from Miami, Florida, but uh, moved here when I was seven years old and lived half time Miami, half time Minnesota till I was about 15, 16 years old. Miami yeah, <laughs> and yeah. Minnesota. What the hell, yep. man? That is so different. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. It was supposed to be for two years. My mother married a guy that was from here and, and uh, it was supposed to be for two years. And then lo and behold, 
two years turned into the rest of my life. So is uh, Miami or Minnesota who you are now? Which one? Uh, I mean, I live in Minnesota, but I, I don't know. I just, I miss Miami. You look Miami hand- to me. You yeah, look I Miami. Can't, I see thank you. you. See, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't I handle never, the cold. I would never in a million years guess that you were in Minnesota you, anyway. But, uh, well, thank you for, for, uh, for indulging me when I, when you were speaking at the event, it was the forward event, Neil, Neil Dinger puts that on in Vegas. And, and, uh, that was the first time I'd ever been, um, Neil and I met by accident at Brad Lee's office. I was recording a podcast, an episode of his podcast earlier this year. And Neil dropped by to talk to Brad about, uh, about the event. And then of course, you, you know, Brad, Brad was speaking yep. there at the event too. And so that's how I met Neil. And he was like, Hey man, I'm doing this event. You should come. And I'm like, okay, what's it about? So I started talking and, and I said, yeah, my wife and I'll come, we'll come. And then, and then I saw your TikTok video and it's just this weird, how everybody came together, but that was such a great event. Had you ever been to one of those events, Neil's events before? So, so Neil, Neil's a good friend of mine. So I've known, I've known him since before, you know, his sort of rise in Instagram and everything. And he's a, he's such a brilliant thinker and strategist and such a good student that watching him put into practice, everything he's been talking about has been great. And so it was my first forward event, but I've known him for years. And, um, I mean, he and his team did such an incredible job at that event. Yeah, they did. I, I was telling people this after the event. I've been to lots of conferences, lots of keynote, you know, keynote events. And and that was by far the best one I'd ever been to. And it, and I think it's a it's a combination. Of course, there were great speakers. You you did a great job. You actually had the whole lights come down and you had a flashlight <laughs> and had this great illustration. Uh, Gary V was on stage up there. Of course, Neil spoke. Brad Lee was there. It was just a, a fantastic group of speakers. But we're, here's the thing that I took away from that. And I wonder if you think the same thing. I think the event was so good because of the community that Neil has built around that. And and that's what made that event made. Although the speakers are, of course, great, but it was the community. What do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, he's he's been brilliant about his community and and he's the guy that's in the trenches his sleeves are rolled up. He's in the DMS. He's talking to people. He's pulling people together. He's constantly communicating to, to, to people that he's connected with. And so, yeah, the, the community of people that are wanting to learn that and, you know, the, the, and, and he picked the, he chose the speakers right as well. The people that kind of contribute to that same message. And so every part of it was on point on message, even the, the, his use of video in, in an event, which I'm not a big fan of video at events. He tore, he tore that paradigm down. He killed it. I mean, the videos were emotional. They told a story and they teed up every piece of, piece of what was going on. Well, and it certainly no surprise. I mean, he's, that's his, that's how he's gone from, I think he was talking about, he was doing a million dollars a year in personal income. And he started the Instagram video thing and then it just quadrupled, quintupled. Um, so that's his, that's his deal. And Neil is actually going to be a, a future guest on the show. We're working on recording. He wanted to do his episode live at his office, which I thought, okay, I'm coming out there anyway. So let's cool. do it. But so well, Neil's a great guy and and I'm grateful for Neil because I get to meet you and, and got to meet you and you spoke to the VIPs uh, on Saturday and got to hear a little bit of your story. Do you think that Neil, you know, since we're talking about him, I'm talking about a little, just a little bit more, do you think, there's some neuroscience and behavioral science behind what Neil's doing to create that community and be so um, connect, having such a good connection with his audience. What do you think about that as a, as an expert in that space? I think neuroscience is everything. I mean, everything, what you're doing is, is neuroscience, what you're, what he's doing is neuroscience. Either we're working with it or we're working against it. And so that's the thing that, you know, like, why do I study it? Because it's the one thing we have in common. It's our brain. And so if what you're doing is working, that means you're working with the science, you're working with the neurology and the biology of how we function, how we process information. So absolutely. And the sequence of how he delivers content, and that's the piece that I think is most powerful. It's not just content because I've got great content, but it wasn't getting any views. It wasn't getting attention until he said, Renee, you're doing it wrong. Because I was teaching, I was doing my content on social the way I do it in person, which assumed a captive audience. It wasn't captive. The moment I made the switch, working with one of the people he works with, we went literally from just in TikTok uh, of following the sequence. We went from 2,000 followers up to 57,000 followers in two weeks. One of my videos at 2.3 million, another one 670,000, another 130, 50,000, 70. I mean, there's just every one of them is just taken off because we finally started using the right sequence and then you put co- good content in the neuroscience of the, the sequence of how the brain functions 
in that environment, right? Now that environment, you can't speak in public or in a, on a stage the way you do on a TikTok or an Instagram reel. So it, the context matters, but he's he's got that nail. He's one of the best I've ever seen. It, he, it, is, uh, it is definitely a success story to pay attention to, but you've got a great success story, which is what we want to talk about on the show today. So how did you get your start as an entrepreneur, so like a lot of people think that, you know, as a kid, you're mowing grass or in your case, shoveling snow <laughs> in Minnesota. But but it, but what uh, like when did your entrepreneurial career start? You know, when talking about entrepreneurial career, gosh, you know, I, my first job was I was a caddy at a country club. You know, I was 12 years old carrying these big bags and four and a half hours carrying clubs in the middle of the summer. It's, it's brutal work, but it was great because you got like 12, 15 bucks, you know, it was awesome. You know, then you could buy a Snickers bar. But I think, you know, entrepreneurship was something that, you know, I think my cousin first turned me on when I was a kid. She talked about, she became a real estate agent. I didn't even know what real estate was as a kid. And she said, I, you know, I get to, I get a car, I get to pick my hours, I get to do, and she talked about the sense of freedom that was just really, really cool, which is ironic because entrepreneur, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, we don't feel very free, but yet we're doing what we love. And so like people say, well, you must be free to make your own choices. I do. I said, but my boss is my clients in a lot of ways, right? So I still have to serve the promises that I've made to the marketplace. And if somebody's paid for it, I've got to serve that. And so that's in essence, I'm accountable to that. But I think entrepreneurship to me is that feeling of creating something, identifying a solution, and then can I put my passion, creativity, and my innovation behind that to solve it at a profit, right? And so it's, it's got to make money, right? Because it's not a mission, which is, there's nothing wrong with a mission, but I can be on a mission and in the business, serve, serve my soul, serve the community, serve all the things, and serve the pocketbook. Those are, those are important aspects of it. Because the more I serve the pocketbook, the more that I can serve in other ways as well. So when you kind of, you did this caddy and thing, um, did, did you ever run across some entrepreneurs just listening to what's going on on the uh, golf course? And did it make any sense to you at the time? I was probably too young to understand, but obviously this was the oldest country club in Minnesota. Uh, and, and so there was a lot of big money there, a lot of old money. And, you know, so it was just you, what you learned though was professionalism. You learned etiquette. You learned to know how to play in a certain environment, how to understand what the rules were. And that's a critical thing. You know, every culture has a set of rules and golf has its own golf culture. And people say, oh, I don't like it. So well, then, you know, this mean, you know, it's, it's good or bad. It's just, that's what the culture is. And the more I can assimilate, you know, if I go to a different country, it also has a culture. And can I understand the rules of that culture? How do I engage? Those are critical skills for emotional intelligence, even as a kid. So a lot of your preparation for success happened on that golf course. You probably weren't even aware of it. Might have not been. And because it's actually the first time, you know, we talk about my story a lot on podcasts, but this is the first time I talked about caddying. It, it, what it taught me was hard work that suffering on that golf course was okay in the hot sun. It was okay because the end, you know, you one, I, I got a workout in cause I, I played basketball. So it was good. And two, it was for a purpose. I got to serve somebody. And if I did well, I got a bigger tip. So you learn that, you know, there was an effort involved and, you know, people say, you know, you want to earn minimum wage, do your job. But if you want to earn a little bit more, whistle while you do your work, you know, it's just like that a little extra thing that is discretionary. What were all the discretionary things I could do to maybe increase a tip by 10%, 15% and uh, just to be of value in certain ways. So, so you did the caddy and thing for a while. You had a family member introduce you to the idea of real estate what what was your first um, LLC? Like, what was the first business that you started? So I I sold cookware door to door in college, which was the best experience ever. I it was cut, <laughs> from, yeah, I was cut from the, the, my team, my basketball team at the sophomore, and I got a chance to ask a CEO of a twenty five billion dollar company at the time, and I got a chance to ask him a question, and I said. You know, I just got cut. I got all this discipline and I, hard work is something I know how to do, but I don't like school. What's the one thing I got to do now to be in your shoes when I get older? And he looked at me and he smiled and he said, you learn how to sell. If you learn how to sell, you'll always be employed. And so I get this letter in the mail saying that I've been selected because of my GPA, which was a 2.3 at the time, <laughs> uh, to join this fast paced sales and marketing company in the health and wellness industry. I was like, sales and marketing and health and wellness. I love to work out. This is perfect. And it was to sell cookware door to door. And that, that was one of the, not one of probably the most transformational thing I, uh, jobs, experiences, 
because it taught me that as long as I sold something, I couldn't get cut, which really meant as long as I added value, I was in control. I was, I had what I wanted. And that's such a critical principle, I think. And so it was sort of entrepreneurial in a lot of ways, even though I didn't own the company, we had to buy the cookware, we had to run it, you know, in a certain way. But my first LLC would have been out of college. I went to work for my mother who owned a consulting business. And uh, long story short, we had to restart it. And I had to go out and start my own LLC to keep it going. Uh, so what was that business? Consulting, training, everything that a lot of what I do now is the foundational elements of, you know, it was a company that used brain research to, to help create massive scale culture change. And using trust, teamwork, um, I learned facilitation skills, all that stuff. We were doing 55 workshops a month all over the country. So it was, you know, it was pretty intense. So, so the, what you're doing now in the neuroscience and the speaking and thought leadership part of that really goes back to that's what you've been doing the whole time. Is that right? The, the whole time. Yep. And it's, it's one of those things that the moment I was introduced to the brain, I was hooked because it was my mother. She said, look around this room. What does everybody have in common? And I couldn't figure it out. But the moment I, I she you know, just thinking of skin color and where they were for accents. And she said, no, everybody has a brain. And if you can understand how the brain works, everything becomes easier. You'll understand how to sell more. You understand how to communicate better, resolve conflict, lead, you name it. If you understand the brain, you understand everything about how we process information and how to deliver it to that. So yeah, it's been something I've done for 28 years. How did your mom get into that? Well, that is a story. So my mother's a former nun and thank God I told people, I said the most inspirational person in my life, but thank God she decided to not be a nun for my sake. Right. Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, so she wanted global peace and community. That was her, it was just who she was. And when, she realized as a, as a nun after eight years, that that's not how she was going to achieve it. She left to work in migrant farm labor in Southern Florida, which is like a Southern, it's basically like a slave labor with no chains. And she learned a lot of lessons on how to empower people that were oppressed and sad and depressed and looking at, you know, at first, you know, you can have a great idea, but if the level of energy is depressed, people aren't going to listen to it. So there's a sequence there and there weren't no, but there weren't any budgets. So she couldn't bring counselors and therapists in. And so she was like, how do I raise the level of energy here first? And she realized there was one thing that was free and it was music and song and dance. And so she'd bring together street musicians to go into these camps. And all of a sudden, like the energy was like depressed and they'd hear the music and they'd start to smile and they'd raise up and realize that person hunched over in the corner was a dancer. And he'd get up and start dancing over there was a singer. She starts singing with us. And you know, I'm four years old with a set of maracas in my hands. And you realize that there's a face painter that came out of the woodworks and, you know, just that she's painting all the faces. And this guy was a better drummer than the guy we brought. So he takes over the drums and, you know, and it was just this within minutes complete transformation of the energy and it was free. And so she looked at that and said, okay, so that's a component of it. Next component was like, how do you instill the inner stability when people, you can empower them to do something, but once they run up against the power, the, the government or the system, if you will, quote unquote, how do they not crumble under that scenario? So you had to have an inner personal and internal strength that had to grow and people had to be able to empower themselves to make decisions. And so one example was there was a group um, that was beat up but with a baseball bat by the labor boss. And so she organized them, took them to court and they won the case. And two weeks later, they're working for him again. And so there was something that there that they, they had to make the inner shift as well to free themselves. So she, so through her experiences, She's like, something's got to be, we got to change something here. Something is not working right. So if it had this positive effect, but it didn't last consistently, there had to be a change. What, what took her to the next step of diving deeper into behavioral science and in, in the brain? Well, she, she had been learning all that in, as a nun, through what they called liberating education in the 70s and 60s, 50s, 60s and 70s. And liberating education is the core foundational work of accelerated learning. And accelerated learning, it's basically using brain research and what we know about the brain and learning to help adults learn faster. You know, for example, you know, to teach accounting, you could use theories, axioms, principles, and, and uh, the, the same things we use at school. Or you could take the whole classroom and make it a, a balance sheet. And you, John, you're a debit. Okay, Sally, you're a credit. 
And so what happens when uh, income comes in, you move over here. And so there's a, there's a kinesthetic component to learning. That would be an accelerated learning technique. And so getting involving all the senses was something really critical back then. And so when she was invited, she was speaking at a conference in Chicago and a guy was there and, and he said, came up afterwards and he goes, can you come to Wilmington, Delaware and do the exact same thing you just did today? And she's like, well, what's in Delaware? He's like, well, I work for DuPont. And he's like, oh, no, no. She's like, I'm a community builder. I don't know anything about the private sector and, and the corporate world. And he's like, nope, just do what you did. And so she went there and knocked her socks off and realized very quickly the same challenges that the communities were facing, businesses were facing. The first challenge that was given was that all the group, 25 secretaries, I say that with quotes, all the executive assistants, there were secretaries back then. I know that's an outdated word. We're all going to quit because of how they were being treated. And so she pulled them all together and pull all the executives together and help them realize that, look, this is why. And it was like the big aha moment of like, they didn't even know that they were feeling that way. And of course the, 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 the execs didn't want that to happen. So they turned things around immediately because of the way she communicated it. And so then given another problem, another problem, and then lo and behold, she's there every other week for two and a half years and uh, started creating programs and processes and trainings and massive turnarounds and, yeah, that's there's a there's a great lesson in that for all the listeners to think about, you know, what what are you being prepared to be successful at? I mean, your mom, you know, Renee was was working in a, a in this labor camp and and just started experiencing things that eventually prepared her to be successful at, in this endeavor and evidently had such an indelible uh, effect on you and left a mark on you that you decided to pick up the mantle and and, and carry it on. So it's, was this always something, even as a teenager watching your mom go through this, that I, I'm going to do this with mom or did you have other aspirations and plans? You know, I, I was 17 years old and I knew like after going through and selling cookware, I knew that I wanted to be in sales of some sort. And, you know, I wasn't sure I, I went, I loved psychology because that was the only class I liked in high school. And so I wanted to go study that. And then when she said to learn the brain, I was like, okay, I'm gonna go study the brain. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I didn't want to be a researcher. I wasn't smart enough, but I was smart enough to understand the research. I was also, I had a curious mind. So I was like, how does this research apply? How does it help me sell more? How does it help me communicate better? How does it help me resolve this conflict lead? You name it. The application of the science was always my passion. And so when we, we looked at that process, I was like, okay, I know at 17 years old, I went to a creativity in the business workplace workshop and it was three keynote speakers. My mom was the, so the last one. And I went there and I'm watching, I'm 17 years old. And this guy goes up, his name's Bill Shepard. And he goes up there and man, he just brings the room down. 600 uh, business professionals in the room and he, they're all engaged. He was funny. He was charismatic. He was insightful. And I was like learning stuff and I'm 17. I'm going, Oh my God. I go, mom, that's what I want to do. What he's doing right there. That's what I want to do. And she looks at me, she goes, really? She goes, well, I'm next. I'm like, Oh no, my mom's not going to follow this guy. She's going to just get torn apart and blah, blah, blah. Anyways, we get a break. I go get a, like a, like a soda or something like that. And I come back and she's already started and she's got a guitar in her hands and she's singing and I'm going, Oh my God, I can't believe she's singing. <laughs> but then I walk in and all 600 people are standing with their arms around each other, singing the song. You have more, you are more than what the critics say. And I'm like, I, she's been singing the song since I was a kid, but they loved it. The energy was there. She did it for like a minute and a half. And that was her way to open the room and to soften the room. And she started speaking and I, I got, I started crying because I'm looking at this. She was, it was like, she was magic up there. The stories made sense. Everything flowed together and it was beautiful and articulated perfectly. And everybody was just sitting on the edge of their seats. It was so good. I'm thinking, I'm going to go, I'm like, I, I guess it's not him. I got to follow her. And it was so good. They did a two page write up on her the next day in the business section of Minneapolis. Wow. So you had no idea your mom could do that. No, I wonder, idea. I wonder how many, I, I probably most, how many kids, teenagers are completely oblivious to what their parents do on a day to day, <laughs> especially people like you and me, the where we're speakers and authors and influencers. And we, we talk and we coach and, and it's different than just going and clocking in at a job somewhere. Like I, I wonder sometimes if my kids even have the, and they're older, they're 22 and 19, but I wonder if they even 
have any idea. <laughs> but you know what happened? Like what, what happened recently is that my I, I did a few videos that, that went somewhat viral, two point three million views on, on TikTok, and now my kids think I'm cool. So <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. You know what's funny is my first TikTok video that went again somewhat viral was just me laughing at my daughter for finding out that I had a TikTok account. This is a true story. So it was like three years ago, three, I think it was three, three years ago, I was in the garage and we were about to get in the car to leave. My wife and I were leaving the car, leaving to go somewhere. My daughter was standing at the, on the stairs, like from the exit from the house into the garage and TikTok came up and I went, you know, and I, and I said to my wife, watch this. And I turned TikTok on real fast. And I said, Hey, Kylie, you know, I have a TikTok account, right? And I turn my phone around and she slammed the door and I just turned the camera around. I just started laughing. And I think I had like 60 or 70,000 views on that. And, Love and, it. and <laughs> I haven't had any TikTok for me is a weird thing because I can't like I don't have any more than two or three hundred views per video. I've got I think I got five thousand followers on TikTok. But man, Instagram, dude, for me is just blown up. I was, uh, you know, I had one video that right now is up today is 21 million views. It's unbelievable. Ridiculous. That's yeah, amazing. It is crazy. And it's not even core content. I would happen to be talking about marriage and divorce and life and family. And, and isn't that and, funny? And, and the comment section, everybody should go to the comments. <laughs> it is <laughs> insane what people are talking about. About divorce I've, I've learned a lot of my about myself through the comment section. Everybody <laughs> thinks that I sound like Mike Ehrman Trout from Breaking Bad. You, well, I think it's because you kind of <laughs> look like obviously a better looking version, younger than him. But but Every, uh, I, like I look at my kids because they, they're huge Breaking Bad. I'm like Mike Ehrman Trout. They look at me, they go, I don't see a dad. I'm like, I don't either. But then it is on YouTube. They say the same thing. And then I'm, and I'm like. Listen, you need to He's do like an old video. man. You need to do a video <laughs> intro of you and, uh, as Mike from the show, drive up in that old Chrysler. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, for people that don't know you. Yeah. I like, I, I don't know you well. Like I can see it. I can see it. Well, I'm I mean, six, obviously. Three. Six three two hundred seventy pounds. I don't think I'm, I'm anywhere near my shot. <laughs> well, well, TikTok, we only see. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. It's funny, but yeah, no, I think that that's that's cool. That like the um, how it how it works that way. It's it's fascinating. I think the the reality is is that you know it, for me it's been it's been a journey of trying to figure out how do you even take deeper content and deeper thoughts onto a short form. Give me something quick and be over format and my favorite videos the ones i'm like okay this is a good thought are the ones that perform the least which is so funny hey we're going to take a quick break from today's episode to bring you our sponsor dub that's d-u-b-b -B. i've been a fan of dub and those guys over there since they started this app and they now have sixty-five thousand companies not just users companies using this app worldwide what is dub dub is a video creation distribution and tracking tool for your email it is an amazing way to send emails that actually get open read and active upon so typing you know that's old we're going to start recording videos this is a video world dub is the place for you to record all those videos and share them through your email to get more conversions action more people clicking and watching things they have a chrome extension a desktop app a mobile app it integrates directly with linkedin imagine trying to get access to somebody on linkedin you send a message and they don't respond but if you send a video right in the program they don't have to leave linkedin to see it dub integrates directly you can create share track videos with dub and you can even put it into your favorite project management tool asana remember shooting a video is a lot easier than typing imagine being able to do that right through your project management tool dub even transcribes your videos and i know we were working on a project recently we need a transcription done and i thought oh yeah that's right dub does it so you just drop the video in dub transcribes it for you it also integrates directly with youtube so you can share an action item in a youtube video so like a link where people can click in a youtube video so you take your youtube video drop it into dub and then dub does the rest and you don't lose your views on youtube that's the best part about that youtube still collects all those views even if it went through dub listen you need to go use dub you can get two weeks for free and 50 percent off your first two months by using this link the real slash dub that's the real slash dub make sure you go and check that out and by the way they also have a dub powered video landing page so you can optimize your social profile on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or YouTube. Check it out. Go to the realjasonduncan.com slash dub. You won't be disappointed. I promise. Now let's go ahead and get back to the show. 
Yeah, I had one that my team did. I've got a great team that does my videos. They're actually one of the sponsors of the podcast and they do a fantastic job. And one of the ones that they did recently, I thought would to me it was like the best video they'd ever done. I thought for for content wise, it was the best one. And, and it did well, but it certainly wasn't the highest viewed or shared or commented upon. It's just weird what we perceive as valuable when really it's the audience that makes the difference and it's about totally. what their what's what their expectations are what they need <clears throat> so what do you uh renee what do you uh, in, in your 27 28 years of experience studying the brain if you had to boil all of that down to the, like this is the coolest thing that you learned about the brain that that <laughs> entrepreneurs need to know about what, what would that be <clears throat> that what we perceive of reality sometimes isn't that's the probably scariest component, how we construct reality and how we can influence it. And also how people are influencing our reality. That to me is the most mind blowing piece where you really, that most of the behaviors that we engage in, we think we're in control of, we think they're purposeful. They're just not. And you have to think about your brain has almost two functions where you have the hidden drivers of why we do things. And then you have this thing called the prefrontal lobe that's there to observe your behavior and then try to make sense of it to tell you a story as to why you're doing it. And when you can separate those two pieces out, you realize just how insanely wrong it is. But yet we believe it to be true. And that to me is the most mind blowing, scariest, but coolest mind opening realization. And I can give you some examples if you want some. Yeah, go for it. This is a, I love stuff like this. I can sit here so all day. <laughs> in the seventies or eighties, this guy by the name of Dr. Michael Gazaniga, he did, he did his, his name is Michael Gazaniga in the seventies, eighties. And he did a study on split brain patients. Now, Split brain patients are people that, so if you think about you have the, the right and the left hemisphere, and they had people that had really bad epileptic seizures. And an epileptic seizure is basically a lesion or a cut in the brain that it might get triggered and start a, a bunch of neurons to start firing, and it just creates this cascade effect, and it crosses over the brain. And between the two hemispheres, there's a, a ganglia, which is a concentration of a lot of neurons called a corpus callosum. It's like a bridge between the two brains. And it would start on one part of the brain and it would cross over the corpus callosum and it would take over the whole brain and you watch somebody have a seizure. That's why almost every muscle is constricting. They might swallow their tongue. They might you know, accidentally bite their tongue off, right? All this stuff's happening. And what they found were, was is if you could sever that corpus callosum, you would keep the seizure on one side or almost eliminate it. And you could basically live a very normal life with a severed split brain uh, mm. experience, except under certain circumstances. So let's know what we know about the brain. The right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. The left side of the brain controls the right. We know that basic function. And so when we're looking at seeing things, it's also your eyes split as well. So if I see something with my right eye, it goes to my left brain. My left eye goes to my right brain. Okay. So now, if you show somebody and you put a dot on a screen and you show a split brain person something on the right side of the screen which goes to the left eye and it goes to the right brain and if you show something on the left side of that dot it's seen by the right eye and it goes to the left brain now what do we know about the right and left brain well the right side of the brain doesn't have a language center so it can't speak it can it's creative it can draw the left side of the brain has a language center and so if you show the left side of the brain through the right eye, uh, a hammer. And you say, so um, Jason, what'd you see? You would say a hammer. But now what if I were to put a orange on the right side of the screen shows the left eye, which hits the right side of the, the brain. And I say, Jason, what'd you see? What do you think you'd say? Well, if it doesn't have language, I, I, I would, I don't know. I don't know what I'd say. You would say, I didn't see anything. So who's speaking? Just your left brain. Huh. Your right brain is sitting there going, mm, 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 mm. it can't speak. It wants to say it's a freaking orange, but it doesn't have a language center. Before it would send the image of the language across the corpus callosum to the left brain to speak for me. But if it can't do that, the left brain is mute. It can't speak. But if you give the, the person a pen in the left hand, which is controlled by the right brain, 
it'll start drawing an orange. That's really weird. And then it gets weirder. And then you go, what'd you draw? Who's speaking now? I'm speaking because the right brain can't talk. The, the left brain is the only one that can talk. And you look at it and you go, and you go uh, a ball. <laughs> 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 and, oh, why'd you draw the ball? Well, I was playing catch with my kid the other day. I figured I'd just draw a ball. Completely made it up. Completely made it up, by the way. And you tell the left, the, the right brain to raise, raise your hand. And it'll raise his hand. And then you say, why'd you raise your hand? Uh, I, I thought I saw somebody I knew. There's nobody there. Because the brain has to interpret our behavior and make sense out of it, even though it's completely wrong. Mm. And so when you realize that, the reason that that's important and fascinating, because you asked what was the most fascinating thing, is that what we perceive through what the media tells us, politicians, our negative parents, to how we perceive the world has so many factors and most often we are wrong. And if I can digest that, I become a more open-minded person. I become more intelligent because I'm open to new ideas. I love that, man. I, I love, I love brain science. And when I was working on my master's degree in education, we did a lot of study of brain science and I incorporated so much of that. And, but I'd never heard that story. That's uh yeah, the brain, man. I, I think God created something amazing and we have just barely scratched the surface into what is possible and understanding what the brain is. I think one of the things I used to teach my kids all the time, I know you'll you'll appreciate that, is that the hippocampus in our brain, which is a small little piece of our brain, handles short-term memory. And in the short-term memory and the hippocampus, uh, if if fed enough times that same information, it'll move it into the long term memory. But you've got to continue to put in. That's why short term memory loss for C patients who are going senile or have Alzheimer's or, or that type of thing. It's their their hippocampus is, is not working correctly. It can't take mm. that short term memory and push it in the long term. And so I always taught my students feed the hippo. You got to feed the hippo because if you if you're trying to memorize this stuff, you got to feed the hippo because if you don't, if you only go cram one time, the hippocampus takes it and you're just relying on your hippocampus to help you pass that exam. You got to feed the hippo. You got to <laughs> you got to send that into the hippo frequently and often so that he'll digest it and put it in the long term memory. So you know, I love I love the brain stuff. It's funny. The way I remembered hippocampus was I pictured a hippopotamus sitting at a computer saving files That's on a campus. Right. Hip and so it would be in the middle of campus, saving files, uh, you know, sitting with a mouse and doing that. So it's a hippocampus. You know, it's interesting. The way to bypass rote memory to incorporate in the brain is because Dr. John Rady, we worked with, with uh, uh, we worked with Dr. John Rady for years on creating one of our courses. He was a head neurologist at, at Harvard. He wrote a book, The User's Guide to the Brain. Beautiful book. And what he says is that, that we don't remember what we calculate to be important. We remember what we feel to be important. And so the way that we do that, so you can, you know, you probably remember where you were when 9-11 happened. Mm -hmm. Do you remember where you were four days prior? No. No, right? We don't remember those things. I talked to people that are older they were, where Kennedy was shot. They know exactly where they were, what they were wearing, what was going on. And what happens is when, when, our, when our principles, values, and emotions are violated, or they're triggered at a much level, your brain just takes a, just grabs everything in that moment and just locks in, they call it light bulb memory. It just like takes an image and it brands it into our brain with immense detail on what's going on. And so we tell people, you want to memorize something, you got to add some emotion to it. You got to add some meaning behind it. Why is it important to you? And, and then, you know, rote memory is a good thing. It's part of the process, but if you can, if you can remember like your first kiss, you'll never forget those moments, those, those, those things. And so then you go, okay, so the use of pathos in communication, we talk about it in the book, it's the emotional appeal. How do you tell a good story? Because the brain is remembering stories and how do you then use that story to deliver the message? Because the, the story is the secret weapon. It's the Trojan horse into your brain. And then I can release not an army to kill you, but I can release a good positive message to love more. I can leave a, a, a positive message to study harder, stay away from drugs, whatever it is. But the Trojan horse is a good story that has emotional connection. I love that. That's, that's very good imagery, as, of course, as it should be, because that's what that's how we learn things. But you're exactly right. We learn through those emotional connections and and what what uh, hits us on that emotional level. All decisions are made emotionally and then justified logically. With that, I think we know that. What are your thoughts on what are your thoughts on auto suggestion? You know, think and grow rich. Napoleon Hill writes a ton about that. And I do a deep study of this stuff. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. So. <laughs> 
I always start with the definition of terms. So we're talking about auto suggestion. <clears throat> Specifically, you're talking about sort of like affirmation and telling yourself certain things, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so there, there's there's a lot of, you know, the power of positive thinking. There's, there's an equal amount of research that says that it's just it's BS, right? There's, there's equal amount of thinking that you've got to use sometimes a negative to drive harder on something. And there's the the negative fear of something and using it appropriately is the challenge right because it's not about guilt or shame but there is nothing more motivating than the fear of loss of something and you know being positive and and, and you gotta you, you follow the huberman lab Mm-mm. um he, so uh, andrew huberman i think it's andrew huberman he's he's i think he's at stanford and he's brilliant podcast but he's his research is deep and his podcast is nerdy enough, but yet applicable. And they talk about positive thinking and positive affirmations and things like that. And there's there's an interesting dynamic around it. You'd love it, but I think that the 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 my application of auto suggestion would be making sure that I control the narrative of what I believe. Right. So you ask somebody in the market today how they're doing, and, and they say, "Oh, I'm just trying to stay above water." Okay, so then you, you, that's the narrative that you're living under. That's going to construct the reality in which I live. So then guess, guess what? My reticular activating system, which controls attention, is going to start seeing the negative. Yeah. And so if, for me, controlling a narrative that says, you know what? No, this is a changing market. But in changing markets is where innovative ideas happen. That's where creativity is, is flourishing. And I also believe that no president has ever decided my income. I also believe that no market will ever determine, because when I sold cookware, I would ask a thousand people, anybody want to buy a $2,500 set of cookware? No hands would go up. Well, look, the market says my my odds are low, but I was closing at 98%. So my narrative was, I don't care what the market says. I'm a sales pro. I'm going to make a market. And so that's a narrative that controls how I see reality and I start seeing opportunity. And as leaders, we need to control the narrative. We need to really manage how we're talking about things because it, it, it just permeates the organization so quickly. And I asked every executive, Hey, what do you think? And it's going to be, Oh, greatest opportunity ever. We've been waiting for a market like this because we shine. Okay. Uh, that's interesting. Control the narrative. And you know, I think that that actually goes back to what you were talking about earlier when I asked you about what the most interesting thing about the brain is. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to, paraphrase what you said, but it was about that essentially that um, perception is not reality. Like that, mm-hmm. that's not what it is. And I think as leaders, you just said that as leaders, we must control the narrative. And I think those two statements co- collide into something I've taught my clients and my students when I was a school teacher, when I was a pastor, I did it as, as a pastor. But as leaders, our job is to make sure that our followers understand that the perception is not reality. You know, that's part of our job as leaders because we have to control the narrative is that you perceive fear, COVID. Oh, everybody's scared to death. You cough on me and I'm going to die. You're going to kill grandma. You know, it's all this 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 narrative that's out there. But as leaders, we need to step up and say, that's not reality. This is not what's happening. And our brain it will will flourish where what and how we feed it. And I love the fact Absolutely. that you're talking about negativity can feed negativity positivity. And that's where, that's why I asked about auto suggestion. Cause part of what I understand about auto suggestion is as I work with my mindset coach he said, if you do these affirmations, you visualize it, you have to make sure the emotion is part of it. You can't just do yeah. it. Factually. You can't dupe it. That's the, that's the, and thank you. You can't dupe gratitude. You can't dupe positive thinking. And when you say dupe, it's just, well, yeah, I do my gratitude practice every morning. I'm like, really, what'd you do? Just write a couple of things down. I want to buy your day. Or did you sit and really feel the potential loss of that thing you value most? You know, do you really you appreciate your wife? Well, imagine losing her. And I'm like, no, my life. No. Oh my God. I'm going to go downstairs and just give her a kiss on the cheek. Like that's the feeling, right? No, I appreciate my arms and my legs. Well, really do you? I mean, they're just saying that. Well, imagine, I'm, well, I remember when I hurt my shoulder, right? And I couldn't even reach out and grab it. So imagine not having the ability. You know what? I got to stop complaining. So I'm going to go get some help on my shoulder, but thank God I have my full arm. Like to really take it deep in, in, in those types of things, you can't, I love how you said it, you can't dupe it in that for sure. 
Yeah. Well, that, and, and, and this goes back to our brain, you know, our subconscious brain is the, is the biggest part of our brain. Our conscious brain is the smallest part and our subconscious doesn't know reality from fiction. You know, that's why we get scared in a, in a scary movie or a fearful, te- uh, a scary television show. Our subconscious just reacting and our, and our conscious brain has got to say, Hey, <laughs> this ain't real, buddy. It's okay. So you can't, you, you've got to train your brain to, to do the right thing. So as an entrepreneur, who's trying to be successful, if you walk around and go, man, this is never going to work. I yeah. suck. You know, our sales are down. It, that's going to feed you, you know, where your energy goes, your, fo- or your focus goes, your energy flows and your energy yes. flow into negative things. How did, yeah. I, 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 what's, how, do, how does one learn this stuff? I mean, you've spent 28 years doing it. How do you get into where you really understand and apply this? You know, I, I, and when I wrote the book, I was, I was telling people that, you know, you're reading this, you like the science, you're not trying to become a neuroscientist. So you got to say, you ask yourself, what does this mean to me? How do I apply the science? That's the applied science is the biggest piece. And there's a lot of out, a lot of things out there that are metaphorically accurate, but literally inaccurate, which is really important because as we did the book, we went through in detail, every study to making sure that was current within just a couple of years. And was it still true? And there were certain things that I'd referenced that I'm like, wow, this was debunked in the 90s. I'm still talking about the reptilian brain and the triune brain theory. You know, that's something that I studied very deeply and I understand it to its core, Dr. Paul McLean. And, and then I realized it was debunked. And then I'm like, hold on a second. And I looked at it and I talked to a couple of neuroscientists, people I know. We par- I partnered with the, the head of the co-founder of the Neuro Leadership Institute. And we had this strong philosophical conversation. I said, but it's metaphorically really accurate. And he goes, yeah, it is. And we still use it that way. It might be literally inaccurate, you know, because maybe there isn't a reptile brain in there that, that we share with reptiles and, you know, things like that. But metaphorically, we can act that way through those same same, you know, uh, features and those same uh, attributes, if you will. And so to me, how do you learn it? One, take an interest in it on people that are focused on the applied side. You know, Huberman Lab is great. My podcast, I go into it. I'm sure the work you do, you, you that's the beauty of what you do is that you distill of all the research, here's one study. So take one thing at a time and then ask yourself, what can I do with it? How can I apply it and learn one thing? And make sure, don't be afraid to Google this. And don't be afraid to Google the studies because it's out there. Like the Dr. Moravian study on, you know, words are 7% and um, the tone of voice is 38% and body language and nonverbals are 55%. Most, one of the most misunderstood studies. I have a picture in my book of my mother teaching it in the 70s. And it's beautiful because you know, so I grew up with that study and I grew up referencing it, but it's also very misunderstood. So I tell people, what do you want to get out of that? Do you want to be the nerd that goes, well, that's not the proper use or it's basically saying words aren't the only way that we communicate, right? Our body language and our tone mean something. You know, I didn't kick the dog. I didn't say he kicked the dog. I didn't say he kicked the dog. What well, tone makes a difference or Hey, great job. Great job. And tone makes a difference. Say, hey, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? Right. Those things make a difference in the message. <laughs> but what we do really matters most. I can say, hey, man, I'll be there on Sunday to help you move. Dude, I'm saying it all right. in the tone, man, I can't wait. You want me to bring some coffee? I'll be there. And then I don't show up. Are you going to be like, well, he didn't show up. That's OK. But he really sounded like he meant it. You don't care about my tone and my words. You care about what I did. Even if I said it all wrong, like, oh, fine, I'll be there on Monday, whatever, on Sunday, whatever. And then I show up there, 745, ready to go with my coffee. You don't even care that I said it wrong. You care about what I did. So there's all sorts of things you can derive from that, that you don't have to be a neuroscientist to, to, to get caught up in it. But I always say the question, does it make you a better leader and a better person? If it does, then it's great research. Well, how do you define the word success? Mm. My definition of success is living what I would believe to be my life's purpose, which is a deep one, but yet not. If you want to hear it. I, I, and so, so living my life's purpose, which I always write these down. I, I record all these. As a matter of fact, yeah. my hundredth episode I did a few weeks ago was just on the hundred definitions of success I got from the previous people. So, so living my life's purpose. So, so what yeah. is your life's purpose? So it's a combination of a few things. Now, I, you know, my mother was a nun. I went to Catholic schools. Uh, I took classes on Christ, faith, and management of wealth. I took, you know, my, I grew up as a Lutheran with my, my stepfather was a Lutheran pastor. Um, I've 
I'm, I love a lot of the Buddhist philosophy and Eastern philosophy. I love, I, I love so many things. And the Dalai Lama once time had, had a, it was, it was a quote that he said that the, the all major religions have one common thing in, in, and they try to make their one common thing is that they try to make their leader or their followers better people. And so I go, okay, that's cool. And then there's a great little book called oneness and it takes all of these major concepts and it finds the same texts in all of the major texts in the Tao, the Quran, to the Bible, to the, to the Torah, all the same stuff written continents separated them, right? Wars separating things, but yet the fundamental pieces are found in the same text. And so we go, okay, so there's something really cool about what's written. And I look at what's truthful and what means something to me. There's a few stories that really, that really meant something to me. And one was um, the story of creation. I thought that was a really cool story. And I always asked my mother, is it literal? She said, you know, well, Jesus spoke in parable. So look at it from a symbolic standpoint. And he said, okay, so it's a six days work, one day rest scenario ratio. It wasn't five days worth two days rest. And then in some of my studies, we looked at some of the repeated words that were most often repeated in, in all of the biblical texts. And one of them that we always came up was the word toil, sweat of the brow, hard work, suffering. And mother Teresa felt that the only way to heaven was through suffering, which was interesting. If you look at, you know, she had access to millions of dollars, any resources she wanted, but yet in Calcutta, those places were horrific. And she got a lot of flack for that, but she goes, no, this is their closest to God through the suffering they go every day. And this is how they get there, which I thought was fascinating. I said, okay, so suffering and hard work is critical. And then you look at the story of the talents, which showed up in all four gospels. And the story of talents is very simply, God comes down and gives one person five talents, another person three, another person one, go off and use them. And he comes back later and says, Mr. Person who gave five, what'd you do? Turn them into, into 10. Wonderful high five. Good job. And three, what'd you do? Turn them into six. Hey, awesome. High five. One, what'd you do? I buried it. And it was said that he, God lost his mind. It was furious. I give you a gift and you didn't use it. And the fact that that came up in all four, I always thought that was really interesting. And it makes logical sense to me. If somebody or something gives me a gift, whether you believe in God as a person, energy, whatever it is, or a higher being, if I'm given a gift, I'm supposed to use it. And so then the question of for what? And... We studied for two years this, this concept called um, work and leisure. Some people say work and play. It's not that. I thought leisure was having beer with my friends or hanging out. Leisure was actually different. It took me several years to understand it. I'm still learning from this. 20 some years ago is leisure was contemplation and reflection, which as they say is the highest form of prayer to reflect on one's life. Did I do good today? Was it what I did a good, am I a good person? Do I need to go and apologize? Is what it was. What I did was right or wrong. Oh, no, I was wrong today. They said that's the reflection, is the prayer. And at the end of each day in the story of creation, what did God ask Himself? Did I do good? Was it good? And if He did, it rested well. And so I got to work hard to do good things, utilizing my gifts in the continuation of His creation. That was the last part to do that. There was a study um, I, I saw from um, Jack Canfield talked about this when I was like 20 some years old. And he said there was a study done on, on near death experiences where they looked at 2,700 people who had died. They saw the light and they came back to life and they all reported seeing the light, but they were all reported seeing relatives or loved ones or meeting them there. But they also reported something interesting. They were asked two questions. And the first question was, did you gain knowledge? And the second one was, did you expand your capacity to love? And it wasn't your ability. It was just capacity. And to me, capacity to love is, it's like, when somebody doesn't deserve it, it's easy to love when, some, when everything's good. I can love you and things are great, but what if you wrong me? What if you betray me? Can I still love you then? Which would be the ultimate expression of grace, the unmerited favor, right? Undeserved love, undeserved favor of God, love of God or whoever. And so if my purpose is, I put all those together to me, and my purpose is to work hard and to uh, utilize my gifts every single day to continue in his creation while I gain knowledge and expand my capacity to love. Man, that's deep. <laughs> yeah. That's really good, man. You just took a journey all around the world and, and uh, through the different religions. And, and I appreciate that perspective <laughs> and I agree with you. So mm -hmm. if your definition of success, Renee is to live your life's purpose, do you consider yourself to be a successful person? Sometimes. 
sometimes right. i Tell think it's I, I, to me it's a daily question it's an hourly question like um after this call you know guys i get emotional talking about it sorry i think <clears throat> I don't usually share that. Um, I've been sharing it more lately, though, which is interesting. I think it's interesting. It's something I just always kept to myself, you know? It's good. But I always kept it to myself, but I think that I get emotional because it's it's meaningful. And I think that, you know, the older you get, you start realizing that the the impact you have on people is really the only lasting thing. And and I don't want to hide it. So, you know, did I do good on this podcast? Yeah, maybe it's because I shared this, this story. And, you know, did I good? Did I do good this morning? Well, I got up and I worked out. Okay, good. I did that. But yet, you know, you can think of 20 things that I haven't done good that I got to fix and I got to go do better. Right. And so to me, it's also got to be a goal that's unattainable because I, we can get into dopamine. There's a whole nother conversation around dopamine and the, the, the role that that plays in us. Because, you know, you look at dopamine and the, the misunderstandings that we have around dopamine right now, I think are, are pretty bad is if you want to go into that piece of it. But I think it's it's a. Dopamine can lead us astray in the wrong way, but it can also be the best cheerleader as long as it's aligned. Yeah. So you think so, about it, if you go ahead. No, no, well, I mean, I think I think this idea of living your life's purpose as success is a has a deep meaning because it, it leads to an inevitable question. Well, what did what then is my purpose? What, what is your purpose? Yeah. So I don't think that happiness is the goal. And yeah, I don't I don't think happiness is the goal. And the reason I don't think it's the goal is because happiness is a fleeting moment. It's something that comes and it goes. And if you're lucky enough to have that bestowed upon you every once in a while, I think I heard Dr. Jordan Peterson say that, which made sense. And I've always felt that that it's, you know, it comes from time to time, but it's gone. Like, you know, gosh, you were like you you were a TEDx speaker. I was too. And like I remember I used to think if I could just speak on TED, it'd be the best thing ever. My life would change. I did, and I was like, Okay, that didn't deliver what I thought it was going to deliver internally. <laughs> and then, you know, okay, well, I write my book. Great, I did. <sighs> well, it's got to be a bestseller. Okay, we'll go after that. Well, it's, now it's a bestseller. <sighs> well, well, okay, maybe I got to get in a chief executive magazine. Okay, we just did two months ago. Oh. And then there's all of these, like, goals that dopamine was driving me to do them. And that's the interesting piece is that, you know, people think dopamine is a reward system. It's not. It's, it's if you look at dopamine, the pursuit of a goal, it goes up. But the moment you reach the goal, it drops. And so dopamine isn't about the reward of achievement of a goal. Dopamine is about the anticipation of the reward. So it rewards the journey. And so we say, okay, so I hated my journey to get to this goal that didn't make any sense, the beach house. And I got the beach house and dopamine's gone. I'm going, well, what do I do? Search for another one. So the outcome is the person that has a healthy dopamine system that is most capable of achieving the beach home is also the person that's least capable of enjoying the beach home because once they get there, the dopamine drops and they go, well, I need another one, a bigger one, or I got to get the Lamborghini or I got to go on this. I got to buy this. I got to get the Rolex. I got to do you name the whatever, fill it in. And all of a sudden we live 40 years of all these fleeting moments of what we thought were going to be happiness. And they didn't serve. And then you go, well, what's my life about? Well, life was happening in between those fleeting moments of happiness. Did you enjoy the journey? Because dopamine is the cheerleader that keeps you to go. But were you going for what purpose? Was the purpose of material gain? Which, trust me, I love material things. But do they serve an internal, the internal need? And the answer is no. We know this. That's why I saw you giggle when I said that the least capable of enjoying it, you go, because I could see you go, that explains so much. I've talked to this with so many <laughs> successful people and they just kind of, they just, they, they, they just melt in their chair. They go, Oh my God. And it's just this mind blowing reality of what am I doing it for? And so to me, the goal isn't happiness. The goal is utility. So what do I mean by that? Somebody once said this, that I want to be the one when the flood comes, I want to be the one who built the ark and to build the ark, you have to suffer. You have to sacrifice, you have to give up everything and you have to say no to all these other things. So the moment that time is need, you can be of service. Yeah. So what's the goal? It's a long way to get to service, serving others in some way.
Man, that is so good. I, I know we could probably continue to talk about this for the next couple of hours. I, I dig having deep conversations with people who uh, who can talk like this and know their stuff. So um, let's talk about let's talk about your podcast and your books. Your podcast is called The Neuro Side of Influence and Leadership, right? Yes. And you talk about this stuff all the time with your guests. And then you've got a book called Amplify Your Influence, which is about this, the applying the the neuroscience to how to be a better, better leader and your influence. Right. So tell us a little bit about either or both of those and how we can get in touch with those, those uh, products that you offer. Absolutely. Well, um, thank you. So the, the, the book was written about um, in, as a result of a course that we offer called Amplify. Amplify is a three day experience where I take 12 executives, leaders, whoever, people that are looking to grow their influence, not being an influencer, but to grow their ability to influence. And we take them through a very intense boot camp where I put them in front of the stage, on front of the room, and I am within a couple of feet critiquing everything from body language, sequencing, timing, um, storytelling, you name it, to break down the process, build massive amounts of self awareness, to then rebuild using the neuroscience and a process and a uh, formula that we call the Amplify formula, which I've been using this entire talk, which would be frame message tie down. You deliver the frame t- to make sure that it's, we're using the frame that is intended, not allowing, not because most people speak without a frame and the listener's brain has to then fill it in with their own frame. <clears throat> and that frame is what determines meaning and reality. Well, I don't want to leave it at a chance. <clears throat> I want to control the frame. And so we frame things, deliver the message and then tie it down, which answers the question of what this means to you is. So that, that course has had massive impact and has grown immensely. And then a uh, publisher saw it and said, please write a book about it. So we did. And at the time of writing the book, I also started a podcast to follow the book process. So the, the first 25 episodes, it's just me going deep into the concepts within the book, um, deeper look behind the book, me talking about it, expressing about it. And then I've got some really cool uh, guests on the podcast, I think are, are a lot of fun. I try to be pretty selective of who I got on there, but people that are going to be um, some thought leaders and, and things like that. And so that's, those are those two pieces. Well, I think that people should take a look at you. You can go to meet Renee that's uh, and Renee's R E N E uh, meet Renee.com to learn more about Renee Rodriguez. If you've enjoyed the conversation we've had today, there's certainly a lot more opportunities for, for the listeners to go deeper and follow them on Instagram at C Renee speak. That's S E E R E N E R E N E speak. <laughs> C Renee speak. And then uh, what's your TikTok handle? What's cause it, cause you're blowing up on TikTok. <laughs> it's uh see Renee speak as well. Everything's see Renee speak. Yeah. So go see Renee speak uh, on TikTok. See his viral videos that are going blowing up there and Instagram, go to meet Renee.com uh, to check out his website. And you can look at his course, his Amplify course that he's got there and he speaks frequently. He's uh, you know, I think he's got another event in Las Vegas with Brad Lee that's coming up. I think it's probably going to happen before this releases. So my apologies if it, if you are interested in it and you've missed it, but uh, this guy is a guy to follow. And so Renee, I'm going to give you the last word. It's been a pleasure to talk to you on the show. I'm going to give you the last word. Anything you want to say to the listeners before we uh, close down for today? Well, if you're still listening, that means you're a learner. <laughs> and so my, my hope for you is that you can hear, take something you, you heard here with our conversation and ask yourself, what's one change that you can make today? Just one thing. Change is a difficult process and your whole body is designed to fight it. You have to fight harder. You have to think deeper. You have to dig further down to find out why you want to do this. Figure out what your values are and ask yourself, is this going to make me closer to or further from? Because at one point, you're going to reach a point where you're going to say, thank God I did. Or you're going to say, man, I wish I would have. Let's not let the regret play win. Let's just get something done today. Just make it small. Do one thing. Amen. Well, Renee, thanks for being on the show today, man. It's so good to have this combo with you. Uh, the pleasure was mine. And thank you for the space to talk about stuff. I don't usually get a chance to talk to about, talk about. Thank you. Wow. So we don't normally get into that much uh, deep stuff on this podcast. And, uh, but, I, but I think that if you listen to that whole thing and you really heard what Renee was talking about, the idea of how we can live our purpose, understanding that that is, that is ultimately what we're all here for is to figure out why we're here and live that out. And that is success. And there's so much neuroscience to that about how God created us and how you knit our, our brains together in our mother's womb. And we came out with this personality and ability to think and perceive and all these emotions that we have. 
what Renee has dedicated his life to doing is helping people like you and me as leaders, as entrepreneurs, as, as, as family members, as, as, as leaders in our family to, to use the power of the brain and neuroscience to be better leaders, to make more impact. So I really encourage you to go check him out, meetrene.com or see Renee speak on any of the social platforms. You can go look him up there. And that Amplify course, uh, you take a look at those videos and watch what he's been able to do and how he's coaching people to have more influence. Not necessarily be, as he said, an influencer, but to have more influence. And maybe maybe that's all you need. So go check Renee out. Go meetrene.com or see reneespeak.com. So thank you for tuning in today. If you haven't left a review or a comment on, on iTunes or Spotify or Stitcher, please do that. That would be so helpful. Now the show's over. You're, you're going to go on about your day, but just take just a minute before you click off on the phone, go in there and just leave a little review. Say, man, I love the show. It's great. Leave a five star. And the reason we need that is because that puts our show to the top of the list to to give more people access to get here and listen to these amazing guests who deliver their stories of success and what success means to them. So thank you so much for everything. Thank you for watching on YouTube. If you haven't watched this on YouTube, it's youtube.com slash the real Jason Duncan. Well, tune in again next week when I talk with yet another very successful entrepreneur about his or her journey to success. Until then, I am the real Jason Duncan and Jesus is King. Thank you for listening to another edition of The Root of All Success with The Real Jason Duncan. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, visit therootofallsuccess.com to access the show notes and other helpful resources. Follow Jason on social media at The Real Jason Duncan. Are you an entrepreneur who feels trapped in the weeds of daily operations, not experiencing the freedom you thought you'd have as a business owner? Want to know the way out? Take Jason's free exit readiness assessment to see how close you are to getting ready to experience true freedom and success as an entrepreneur. Go to amireadytoexit.com today. That's amireadytoexit.com. See you again next time here on The Root of All Success.